I was in France last spring, and I had a French interpreter. My French is pretty non-existent. And I discovered a couple of things. One is there is no French word for blob. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to explain the phrase dead giveaway took 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay. I've got a text here of a, a Pali Sutta. I'll be doing a little reading from it tonight. For most people who, a lot of people who don't know anything about Buddhist texts have probably heard at least a passage from one of the texts in the Pali Canon, which is a passage from the Galama Sutta, which explains why you don't have to know about texts. Um, um, the usual version you see, um, and I've been collecting these over the years, uh, one is um, follow your own sense of right and wrong, the Buddha. Okay. Uh, another one is believe nothing, no matter who said it, even if I said it, if it doesn't agree with your own reason and common sense. Um, there is even a scholar who translated this way, quoted it this way. When you know for yourselves that these things are wholesome, these things, when entered upon and undertaken, incline toward welfare and happiness, then galamas having come to them, you should stay with them. And this all sounds like the Buddha is being a really nice guy, saying, hey, just believe what you like, and it doesn't really matter. However, it turns out that they're only translating part of it. You might say, instead of being lost in translation, something's been lost in quotation. <laughs> hearing? Okay, I should pull this closer. Does this work? Can you turn up the volume? Is there a volume? How's this? Is this better? A little better. Okay. 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 Um, I made the mistake of Googling myself yesterday. Um, I mean, we don't have internet at the monastery, so it's a rare experience. And I came across a quote saying that I had the most soothing voice in the world. Um, <laughs> that I could put caffeine to sleep. So, um, <laughs> so, so anyway, back to the Galamas. Um, it turns out that the Buddha is saying something much more complex about who you can trust, where you can place your um, reliance when you're trying to figure out what to believe, how to act. On the one hand, he's saying, let me, let me quote this for you. He says, um, don't go by reports, by legends, by tradition, by scripture, or by the thought this contemplative is our teacher. That's pretty much saying you can't place all of your trust in other people or in other texts. But he also says, don't go by logical conjecture, by inference, by analogies, or agreement through pondering views, by probability. In other words, your own sense of reason and common sense. Um, you can't really trust that either. You can't, it may seem re there are many things that seem reasonable but are not true. Many things agree with what you already believe but are not going to actually be helpful. Um, so this puts us in a dilemma. Who do you trust? Where do you learn? Where do you place your, uh, your reliance? Um, so you've got two problems here. On the one hand, you can't trust yourself, and you can't trust other people. <laughs> um, now, I was talking to Larry before this afternoon, and he was making the point that um, he wanted me to make sure that I warned you that there was something that he finds very ironic about a lot of people who come here to practice meditation, which is that on the one hand, they say, don't tell me what to believe. And on the other hand, they say, Tell me what to do. <laughs> Don't make me think. Okay. Both attitudes, of course, are irresponsible. On the one hand, what you believe is not just your own affair, because it's going to have an impact on your actions, and your actions will have an impact on other people. So there's an attitude of responsibility. You have to look at what you believe, why you believe it, what sort of evidence you have for that kind of belief. And secondly, of course, there's the question of what you do is going to have an impact on other people too. But figuring out what works and what doesn't work is going to rely to a great extent on your own willingness to test things and make mistakes, learn from your mistakes, um, and then improve your behavior as a result. 
And this is basically what the Buddha was telling the Galamas. He says basically, when you know for yourselves that when something, a, a teaching is adopted, and it leads to unskillful behavior, then you should abandon it. If you know when a teaching, when adopted, leads to skillful behavior, then you should take it on. So basically he's saying that you have to test things in your own experience. And testing it doesn't mean you test it for five minutes and say, I don't like this. You have to be willing to test things sometimes over time, being willing to give it a really fair test. But he also goes on to say this. When you offer yourselves that these qualities are unskillful, and the word quality here, dharma, can also mean teaching, can also mean action. Um, and in the Buddhist teachings, those concepts go together. Um, you know that these qualities, teachings, actions are unskillful. These qualities are blameworthy. These qualities are criticized by the wise. Now, that means it's not just your own perception, but you also have to take into consideration what do wise people think? Is this something that they criticize or is this something that they praise? So it's not just you in looking at your own actions, but you also have to figure out, well, who's wise? And so it's interesting to look at the rest of the sutta to see the Buddha's examples of what he thinks you can test for yourself and what sort of things you should be willing to pick up from the wise as you go through life, trying to figure out what to believe and what to do. First, he makes the, makes the proposal. He says, now what do you think? When greed arises in a person, does it arise for his welfare or harm? And they say it arises for harm. And when you're a greedy person, overcome by greed, mind possessed by greed kills living beings, takes what is not given, goes after another person's spouse, tells lies, and induces other to do likewise, all of which is for long-term harm and suffering. And they say, yes, that's the case. And then he makes a similar point about aversion and delusion. So what he's saying here is, is several things. One is, okay, you test a teaching by the actions that it is going to inspire you to, to take on. Secondly, he's saying, your actions are determined by your mind states. If there's greed in your mind, you're going to act in a certain way. If there's no greed in your mind, you're going to be acting in a different way. Um, greed, aversion, delusion are unskillful mind states because they lead you to engage in harmful behavior. So he's saying that okay, th the action is determined by the motivation. The action will then also give results. Now this is kind of the Buddhist teachings and karma on a nutshell. Um, and it sounds pretty common sense, and it's basically the way we live our lives anyhow when we're serious. <laughs> there are lots of times we like to think, well, I can get away with this and it won't matter. Of course, it does matter later on. What's important, though, is that the Buddha says, basically, you can observe these kinds of principles for yourself, that your motivation really is important. Um, this turns out it was a controversial point in the Buddha's time. Some people said that the actions you're doing were, were influenced by the stars, they were influenced by outside forces, they were influenced by fate. Um, and therefore your actions don't really matter. Your attitudes don't really matter. Um, other people said, well, you do have actions, but they don't really have an impact on the world. The world is already predetermined. Um, when you act, it's like drawing a line in the water. It just immediately disappears. So the Buddha here is saying, basically, well, look at your common sense. If you lived that way, you would die. So take your common sense to begin with as a basic proposition for how you would look at what kind of behavior and what kind of mind states are the things that you want to take on? Um, and what kind of things do you want to abandon? The, the impli also implicit here is the fact that you can change your mind. You're not stuck with a particular mind state. When greed comes up, you don't have to act on greed. Um, I was talking to a student a couple weeks back, and he was saying, you know, it's like the body has a mind of its own. You can tell yourself that you're not going to give in to lust or aversion, and all of a sudden, there it is. <laughs> and you just got to go with it. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> it's not, the body doesn't have a mind of its own. The body doesn't think. Um, if the body were not fed, it wouldn't complain. It would give you a little pain, but the body itself just kind of lies there. You know? um, um, basically, it's, what's happening there is one part of your mind is playing tricks on another part of your mind. You've got to watch out for that. So you don't have to give in to mind states as they arise. This is an important point. That kind of principle is something the Buddha says you can actually observe on your own, that certain mind states will lead to harmful behavior, and it's in your own best interest to try to change them to more skillful mind states. Now this question of what you would expect to learn from the wise is illustrated by two teachings that follow after this. 
He says, once you learn how to abandon greed, aversion, and delusion on an everyday level, then he recommends that you develop what are called the four Brahma Viharas, or the four sublime attitudes. Now, most of you probably heard of them, but I'll give you a brief review. The Pali word for the first is metta, which means goodwill. Um, there's mudita, uh, excuse me, karuna means compassion, mudita, empathetic joy, and ubeka, which is equanimity. And the Buddha says you should try to develop these without limit. Here's his phrase. You keep perverting the first direction, the east, as well as the second direction, the third and the fourth, i.e. the south, the west, the north, with an awareness imbued with goodwill. You keep pervading above, below, and all around, everywhere and every respect, the all-encompassing cosmos, with an awareness imbued with goodwill. Abundant, expansive, immeasurable, free from hostility, free from ill will. And then he says the same for the other, for the Brahma Viharas, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. Now notice the purpose here is to develop a mind state that you can learn to trust yourself. If you genuinely have goodwill for everybody, you're not going to go out and kill them. You're not going to go out and steal their things. So you're trying to develop these attitudes as a foundation for your actions. Um, goodwill, to begin with. Some people translate this as loving kindness. Well, it turns out there is another word for love in Pali, which is bema, like bema children. Um, and the Buddha does not, does not recommend that you develop universal bema. Because, you know, as we all know, love is not a very trustworthy emotion. Um, um, it contains a lot of good things, and it can contain an awful lot of jealousy and possessiveness, craving and clinging. So the Buddha recommends instead goodwill, which is an attitude that may all beings be happy, may they find true happiness. Now the phrases that the Buddha uses in the canon to describe the attitude you want to have are really instructive. Um, he says one of them is that may all these beings be happy, free from animosity, free from trouble, free from oppression. And then he ends by saying, may they look after themselves with ease. In other words, you're not promising that you're going to be there for them, you're pro hoping that they'd be there for themselves, and that they have the happiness of self-reliance self and independence, rather than having to depend on you. So this is not so much loving kindness or cherishing, but just wishing that all beings find a true happiness, find a stable happiness that they can depend on. There's another passage where he says, may all beings not have any disdain for others and not wish ill to other people. Here, here he's basically saying, may they act on the actual genuine causes for true happiness. It's not like you know, your wishes of goodwill are like a magic wand that you just wave around and make everybody happy. <laughs> that was very expressive. <laughs> You're basically wishing that other people will understand the causes of happiness and act on them so that they will be able to you know, create the causes for true happiness in their lives and then experience that happiness. Um, you may have heard the passage, you know, just that as a mother cherishes her only child, so she should cherish all beings. The Buddha never actually said that. He said, just as a mother protects her only child, you should protect your attitude of goodwill. It's a big difference. Uh, when you protect your goodwill, you realize, I've got to maintain this attitude so that I don't harm anybody uh, in any conditions. Um, this is why one of, the re one of the ways you spread thoughts of goodwill is that you, know, you start thinking first of you know, your goodwill for yourself, goodwill for those you love, goodwill for people you're more neutral about, and then finally people you don't like. Now the Buddha is asking, when he has you spread goodwill to people you don't like, he's not asking you to like them. He's simply saying, I don't want to harm this person, I hope that this person and if the person is a real bastard, may he change his ways <laughs> and learn to be a really nice person, a really you know, skillful person. Um, and then ask yourself, is there anybody out there that you could not wish that for? And I'm sure that all of us can have a few people coming to mind. That we'd like to see them squirm a little bit before they find true happiness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but then you have to ask them, so what would you gain by that? aside from a little cheap satisfaction. Um, many people, when they suffer, instead of becoming wise and compassionate, will turn to give more suffering to other people, just as a kind of revenge. So it really would be in the interest of, of the whole world that if everybody learned the true causes for happiness, learned how to act on them, and actually created the causes for true happiness in their lives. And so you want to be able to think through everybody for whom you have issues until you can actually wish those people goodwill. 
And this is the category that takes the most time, but it's the one that's most fruitful when you spend that amount of time on it. Um, as for the other, oh, one final passage that the Buddha has, uh, spreading goodwill, there's an incident in the Ken where a monk is bit, bitten by a snake and killed, dies from the snake bite. And so the monks go and they report this to the Buddha. And the Buddha said, you know, if that monk had spread thoughts of goodwill to all four great families of snakes, the snake wouldn't have bitten. And so then he, chant, he teaches them a chant to um, you know, spread goodwill to snakes. And it um, starts out, may footless beings be happy, may two-footed beings be happy, may four-footed beings be happy, may many-footed beings be happy. I have goodwill for footless beings, two-footed beings, four-footed beings, many-footed beings, and so on. And he says, may all beings who everywhere and every place find happiness, may they meet with good fortune. And at the very end it says, may they go away. <laughs> so, and um, you think about snakes. I mean, how would a snake re respond to your loving kindness? You know, it would get freaked out. Um, my teacher tells a story. One time, he was he was um, he went into his room one day, and he saw a snake had gotten into the room. And as he opened the door, the snake went into a, behind a cabinet. And so he decided, well, let's leave the door open so the snake leaves the room. Well, for three days, the snake refused to leave the room. It just kind of hung out in the room. And um, so he was very careful, trying not to startle the snake. And finally, though, on the, th on the night of the third, third day, he sat in meditation, and in his mind he addressed the snake, and he said, look, it's not that I have anything against you, it's just that we're a different species, and it would be very easy for misunderstandings to come. <laughs> And so there's plenty of space for you to be happy out there in the forest. And then he just sat there and spread thoughts of goodwill to the snake, and the snake left. So, so I mean, this understanding of goodwill helps, you know, takes into consideration that there are a lot of people out there who, you know, you really don't wish them ill, but they wouldn't be happy to be around you. And this doesn't apply just to snakes, but there are probably people that you've harmed in the past, and they would just rather not have to deal with you again. Or people from me, for, me, for, for you, that it's really difficult to deal with a person, it's just better to say, okay, goodwill, you know, may you find happiness in your life and just kind of leave each other alone. That's the kind of attitude the Buddha wants you to develop, was realizing that there are times when love is appropriate, but there are other times when there are a more distant goodwill is appropriate. But the goodwill has to underlie everything, as you're guaranteed to yourself that you're not going to harm anybody, or give rise to unskillful mind states that would lead to harmful behavior. Similarly with compassion. Compassion is essentially goodwill applied to people who are suffering. You, know, you wish this person to be happy, but you see that they're suffering, or you see that they're creating the causes for suffering. They're acting in unskillful ways, in which case, okay, you wish them, you feel compassion for them. If there's something you can do to help them, you try to help them. If there's not, we'll talk about that in a minute. But compassion is the attitude that goodwill takes toward people who are suffering or causing suffering. Empathetic joy is the attitude goodwill takes towards people who are happy or who are creating the causes for happiness. You are happy with them because they are happy or they're acting in a skillful way. Um, finally, though, equanimity is the attitude you take where you cannot make a change. You realize that something lies beyond you, either because of your past karma or the other person's past karma or their present karma. They can't accept your help. Um, and this is when you have to develop an attitude of equanimity. And this has to apply even to people you love. And this is where it really gets difficult. You know, the people you know are suffering, but there comes a point where they're beyond you. And you have to learn how to accept that, not to make yourself hard-hearted, but simply so that you can redirect your goodwill towards, or your active goodwill towards people you actually can help. So you're not squandering it and squandering your energy in areas where it's not going to help anybody. So these are the four attitudes that the Buddha would have you develop. This is one example of you know, what you would expect to learn from the wise, that you really have to develop these attitudes across the board to as many people as you can think of, um, so that it, you, know, you will learn how to act appropriately when the, the occasion calls for it, or act into a particular appropriate way, depending on the occasion. That's the first thing that you would expect to learn from the wise. Then the Buddha says, if you develop these attitudes and act on them, there are four assurances, and they basically boil down to two. Um, one is, if there is a world after death, and there is the fruit of good and bad actions, and I have acted in a way that's going to protect me from suffering after I die. 
The other is, if there is no world after death, if there is no fruit of good and bad actions, at least I've be behaved in a blameless way now. I'm not causing trouble for myself. I'm not causing trouble for other people. So um, the Buddha isn't, here is not saying he's going to force them to believe in the principle of rebirth, but he does say, if you cannot come down on either side of this qu particular question, and it's important to realize that not everybody in India in the Buddhist time believed in rebirth. It was actually a hot topic. Um, people saying yes, people saying no. Some people saying, well, yes, there is rebirth, but your actions have no influence on it. Um, it's basically said it's like a string unwinding. It just, however the string unwinds, that's how it goes. And then when it ends, that's the end of things. But it's not really influenced by people's actions. So the Buddha, when he was talking about rebirth, was not just picking up a belief that everybody had in his time. And that's an important point to note. But he's, here he's talking to the Galamas, who have presented themselves as skeptics to begin with. They've s listened to a lot of teachers, and they don't know who to believe. The Buddha said, though, if you cannot come down on either side of the issue, then you have to be prepared for either side to be true. It's like when you're investing. <laughs> you know, are they going to go for war in Iran, or are they not going to go for war in Iran? Okay? How are you going to arrange your investments? You know? even though I do believe anybody would be so stupid as to do this, um, what, you know, how would you prepare it? And if you go to your financial advisor and the financial advisor says, I don't know, you would not take that as a, you know, that's not what you're paying your financial advisor for. You, know? you want some advice on, okay, given that this, this is a possibility, that's a possibility, how should I arrange my investments? Um, and when you think about it, every time you act, it is a kind of investment. You're developing a certain quality of mind. You're acting in a particular way that takes energy. And the question is, is this worth the energy that goes into the action? You know, if I act simply doing something that I like to do and it's easy, am I you know, endangering myself in the future? And as the Buddha is saying, if you cannot come to any clear conviction either way, whether there is rebirth or there's not rebirth, you at least got to be prepared for either eventuality. Um, and so he says, if you develop these four Brahma Viharas, and if you act on the attitudes that you're or the qualities of mind that you're trying to develop through them, then you are preparing yourself for either eventuality. Um, so the Buddha is not saying that you know, he himself didn't know whether there is or is not rebirth. I mean, that was actually one of the um, things he discovered on the night of his, of his awakening that there is rebirth and it is determined by action, but he couldn't prove it to anybody else. Um, what he did make, though, was what might be called a pragmatic proof, which is that if you believe in it, you're going to act more carefully. You're going to act more skillfully. Um, but again, he never forced any belief on anybody. Um, so those assurances are what the Buddha ends his instructions to the Galamas with. And so these are the two things that he would recommend that you look for from the wise. One is instructions on how to develop those four attitudes of unlimited goodwill, unlimited compassion, unlimited empathetic joy, and unlimited equanimity. And then ways of behavior so that you would be prepared either for there not being rebirth or for there being rebirth afterwards, so that you could feel safe either way. Now it turns out when you're looking to advice from the wise or looking to learn from the wise, it doesn't end just with what they tell you. Um, there's another passage related to this where the Buddha talks about seven qualities you would look for in a person that he calls worthy of respect. And it's interesting to look at the list. Um, the first two members of the list are knowledge of the Dharma, knowledge of the meaning of the Dharma. Now that kind of thing can be talked about. You can learn in words, you can listen to Dharma talks, you can read books. What did the Buddha say? What does it mean? How do you apply it to your life? Um, but the other five qualities are not that kind of knowledge. They're a different kind of knowledge. Um, the kind of knowledge you can pick up only if you live with a person for a while and notice that person's behavior and begin to pick up that person's attitudes and habits. Um, the first one is knowledge of yourself, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are. Second is knowledge of um, the right time and place. What's the right time and place to talk? What's the right time and place to be silent? What's the right time and place to be assertive? What's the right time and place to, to withdraw? The third is knowledge of, excuse me, Knowledge of enough. <laughs> how much is enough in terms of food, clothing, shelter? Um, again, how much to talk, how much not to talk, those kinds of things. The fourth one is having... I'm losing myself here. The fourth one is having a sense of how to talk to different groups of people. Um, in, their, in their times, you know, you talk to Brahmins in one way, you talk to noble warriors in another way, you talk to um, 
like merchants in another way. Here, you know, you talk to CIMC one way. <laughs> when you're at the monastery, I talk another way. <laughs> um, um, when kids come up to the monastery and yell out, God is great, out of their pickup truck, I talk to them another way. <laughs> That's the fourth group. And then the fifth thing that you pick up from a wise person is how to know what kind of people to emulate, what habits to look for, what behavior to look for that's worthy of emulation or not worthy of emulation. In other words, how to judge people as to whether you want to pick up their habits or not. Um, so these are five qualities. That, you know, I could sit up here all night and talk about them, but there's no way that you would necessarily be able to embody them in your own actions. The best way to do that is to live around somebody who embodies these qualities. And then you can learn from them and pick them up, because these are the kinds of things you're going to need in your life in order to behave skillfully, both in, in changing your own behavior and in having a good influence on the people around you. Now this is one of the reasons why the Buddha set up the monastic Sangha, and he set it up like an apprenticeship. You know, a, a, a new monastic comes in, stays with the teacher for five years, and there are lots of protocols around how, you, you know, how you're supposed to treat your teacher and the things you're supposed to pick up from the teacher. And a lot of it is just spending a lot of time with this person, noticing how that person deals with difficult people, how the person deals with illness. I know in my case, most of the Dharma I learned when I was an attendant to my teacher in Thailand was seeing how he handled his illness, seeing how he handled really strange people coming with strange questions, um, seeing how he handled um, crises in the monastery. Um, and you know, he never talked about it, but seeing him in action, I learned a lot. And this is, this is a lot of how the Dharma gets really passed on. It's not just the stuff in the books. It's not just the stuff in the text. There's a lot of sort of personal habits that you get picked up. And this is why the Buddha established the monastic Sangha. It's also why he made sure that the monks didn't go hiding away between, behind cloister walls. He had the opportunity for monks to mingle with lay people so the lay people can also have an opportunity to pick up these, these habits as well. So this essentially is what the Buddha is telling us in, this, in the Galama Sutta is one, okay, you have to take responsibility for the things you believe. Um, and you can't just t go by what you like, and also you can't trust somebody else to tell you what to believe. You have to take teachings and put them into practice and see what works and what doesn't work in, in being harmless and helping to put an end to suffering. Um, secondly, you want to look for behavior that's also going to be praised by the wise, which means that you have to look for wise people. Um, and this, this is a priority that seems to be lacking in our lives. Most of us, when we get out of college, what's the next thing you do? You get a job. And um, the question is, are you working with wise people? Are you working with people whose habits you want to pick up? For many of us, that has to get put to the side because we need, we need the money. Okay? Um, but that means that outside of your work, you really have to be extra careful to try to find people who you can actually admire, whose behavior and whose habits you would like to pick up if you're really serious about your happiness. So in other words, the Buddha is saying, you've got to re be responsible. One, for your behavior. Two, for trying to recognize wise people. And three, for making the effort to learn from them. And this way, cause then you can start to find what's really reliable, both in terms of your actions and the things you're going to believe. Um, those are the points I wanted to make. So I'm supposed to give you five minutes to get up and stretch or something, is that? Or is that some, some other place? Says, pause for a moment to let people leave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>